I am so tired of Zoom meetings. And I think I'm probably not the only one, right? During this quarantine time, many of us have been relying on Zoom or some other video chat platform, not only to work, but even to see families or friends. We spent so much time on the computer that the shine is kind of worn off of this thing. It's a wonderful technology, but it has its limits. There've been several articles written about the extra work that Zoom and these other platforms force us to do. In a Zoom meeting, you're always on, for example. We don't have those natural, comfortable breaks in conversation that happen in physical gatherings. We're pressured to fill those breaks because we're always looking at one another. And yet, even as we do that, we are never making eye contact, that simple, powerful connection between two people. And there are other body language cues that we miss when we communicate across cyberspace as well. And our brains end up having to work overtime trying to read people on the screen as they naturally would in real life. From the very beginnings of this stay-at-home order, I've been curious about how this time will shape our interactions in the future, once the danger that presented by the virus has been mitigated or eliminated. At first, I wondered if suddenly all of us becoming fluent in this new virtual way of being would make people more likely to work from home or visit friends from home or even shop from, uh, worship from home. After all, I mean, why get dressed up and go out when we can just pop open the computer, right? But the longer this goes on, the more I think that we are all going to be so exhausted from this extra work required by telepresence that people may actually be able, more eager to gather in physical space than we were before this all started. Now I wonder if when this is all over, we may actually give up some of those virtual interactions that we're used to, things like shopping on Amazon or ordering delivery or using an ATM simply so that we can have another excuse to interact with real people. Even my own introverted self is starting to suffer from the lack of personal contact. Normally, I'm completely happy to spend my days off, sequestered in my office, reading or playing computer games. And I've generally been very happy with this new socially distanced routine. I get to come and sit in my hole all day and be in my own little world. But I'm also beginning to notice that I'm more restless, more irritable, more lethargic, because I'm not getting that chance to actually be around other people. Even with all the Zoom meetings and the webinars that I attend every week, virtual interactions have been a lifesaver. But in the end, I think we're finding that they are still a poor substitute for physically being together. These things are on my mind this week because we have just on Thursday observed the Feast of the Ascension. The Ascension is an odd little holiday in which we celebrate the day that Jesus left. That's a strange thing to celebrate, isn't it? And as such, it's never been a very big deal on the church's calendar. Ascension Day reminds us that while the first disciples got to know Jesus and spend time with him in physical space, we have a relationship with Jesus that's been more like speaking on Zoom. We've been on Zoom with Jesus our whole lives. It's a poor substitute for having him physically here with us, but it's better than nothing. This virtual connection with God is all we've ever known. It's all we ever expect to know. Imagine for a moment that this quarantine was to last for decades or centuries. Imagine never having known shaking a stranger's hand when you meet, or hugging a friend, or sitting down to lunch with colleagues. In a way, Ascension invites us to reflect on how sad and sorry this whole state of affairs is. In light of this, I think that this quarantine has actually helped us see how important physical contact is with others, and how important physical gatherings are. But I also think that no matter what poor substitutes they might be, quarantine has taught us that virtual gatherings are just as real as physical ones. Yes, we're all tired of Zoom and Google Hangouts and FaceTime, but neither can we imagine trying to do all of this without them. Instead of being completely cut off from friends and family and coworkers, 
at least we still have this tenuous, imperfect lifeline between us. As frustrating, as exhausting as it may be, we're still grateful for that. Throughout John's Gospel account, every word of the narrative that the evangelist uses points to intimacy. Words like father and son, know, abide, love, one. We're reminded that Jesus' entire purpose in becoming human and living among us is to reveal God to us, to connect us to his Father, to share God's love with us so that we might be able to abide with God as he does. After the ascension, we remember that even now, Jesus is in God's very presence, praying for us. And because of our connection to him through his love, so are we. He is the vine, and we are the branches. Granted, this is kind of a Zoom-like vine at this point, but it's still a real connection, even if Jesus isn't here with us in the flesh. And yet, alongside the grief and the pain and the frustration of his absence, there's also a promise, right? This Jesus, whom you, whom has been, uh, who you, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Much like all those Zoom meetings and virtual happy hours and FaceTime calls with family are getting us through this period, as we look forward to a time when we can be together in person again, Jesus' prayer today. And his message of the abiding love of God also remind us that this painfully virtual connection to God, the only connection we've ever known, is not all there is. One day, our quarantine period will be over. God's reign will be fully realized here on earth, just as it is in heaven. But it's not our place to know when or how. Much like our present situation in quarantine, we all have to find ways of dealing with this reality. Some of us prefer to sit back and wait, paying no attention to what's going on around us here and now because we think it's not real, not important. So what if the world is burning up, we say? Who cares if people are oppressing and enslaving and killing one another? God will show up eventually and put everything to rights. So until then, eat, drink, and be merry. But to live this way denies the love and the passion that God has put into being with us now. It refuses to love the world as God loves it. It's like refusing to Zoom or even write letters or talk on the phone with someone because you'd rather wait until you can see them in person, even if that time is decades or lifetimes away. Others of us want to be proactive. We believe that we can bring God's reign into existence and we will keep on pushing and shoving until we get it here. We begin to imagine ourselves as the saviors of the world. We're like the people protesting the stay-at-home orders and refusing to wear masks in public. We think we're fixing the problem, not realizing that we're only poking at the symptoms. We fail to see that climate change and racism and war and poverty and hunger and oppression, that these are all just the symptoms of a world that is held in the grip of a pandemic of sin. We can no more save the world from sin than a protest can cure the coronavirus. Only God can save us. Instead of these things, God calls us to patiently and persistently and intentionally live in the time in which we find ourselves. Jesus prays that we might come to know that through God's love made flesh, we have already been given real unity with God, even if it is virtual, and that we might continue to experience that unity by continuing to live in that love. God's love will not let us sit idly by, doing nothing but drinking and binging Netflix, although that's not to say that some of that may not be a bad way to spend time at home. But neither does that love compel us to go out and try to accomplish something that's beyond our ability to do. During this COVID quarantine, lots of people have been taking up new hobbies. Gardening, mending clothing, knitting, learning a new language. They've been spending extra time with family or making an effort to reconnect with people with whom they've lost contact. They found ways to use this time as a gift, 
to use it uh, to enrich themselves for what's coming next. Those new skills and activities will hopefully change their post-COVID lives for the better. The gospel encourages us to remember that, just like this quarantine, we live in liminal space, a time between what is and what will be. The time between Easter and Pentecost is liminal space. There's hardly anything written about those 50 days in the Bible. And yet those days were vitally important for what was to come next in the lives and the ministries of the apostles and the entire church. In a similar way, I believe that God is preparing us with this liminal space between Jesus' ascension and his return for what comes next. God is always preparing us and transforming us into the people we are becoming, shaping us in love and service to others and the world so that we may be ready for the world that God is already bringing into being. In this liminal space, we are reassured that although Christ is not present with us as fully as we'd like him to be, he is nevertheless with us. He's here in these real virtual gatherings of the church. He's here in our altered and sometimes irregular communion practices. He's here in the relationships that we are making and maintaining and even deepening in the midst of quarantine and social distancing. He's here in the faces of neighbors who come to our aid and in the faces of our neighbors in need. It might be a Zoom kind of relationship that we have with him for right now, but it is real. And it holds, uh, it holds in it the promise of a fuller, more life-giving presence to come one day when we get back to normal.